So thank you for joining today's Health Education and Learning Program webinar, Building a Strong Foundation for the Transition to Value. By participating in this webinar, participants will learn about characteristics of value-based healthcare, better understand the cornerstone of the business of healthcare, and explore the components of a strong business and flexible infrastructure. With that, I'd like to welcome our guest speaker, Tammy Norville, she is the Technical Assistance Director with the National Organization of State Offices of Rural Health. Tammy Norville joined NOSOR as the Technical Assistance Director after serving rural safety net providers for almost 15 years in the North, Calif or North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services Office of Rural Health. As a University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill graduate, Tammy brings a myriad of experiences and expertise to her role, including leadership development, facilitation of collaborative partnerships, program and regular, regulatory compliance, coding and billing and documentation, and capacity and skill development for State Office of Rural Health and stakeholders. Tammy maintains a certified professional coder instructor, certified professional coder registered medical coder, registered medical biller, and registered medical manager certification. We feel very honored to have you with us today, Tammy, and I am now going to turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Angie. I'm excited to be here. Um, and I'm looking forward to this three-part series, spending um, basically the month of June with y'all. Um, so today we're gonna lay a little foundation and um, some things we're going to move through rather quickly and some things we're going to lean into just a little bit. That's just kind of how I roll. Um, so if you have questions, don't hesitate to drop them in the chat box. And Angie's going to help um, pay attention to that because sometimes I don't as I'm talking. Um, and if I get on a roll and you just need me to move on, you just let me know. Um, so. Oh. There it goes. Whew. Um, learning objectives are here for you. One little disclaimer, um, any coding, billing, guidance that's referenced um, throughout today's session or sessions come in the future with me, um, just want to remind folks that it's um, the presentation is based on the information that's available at the time, and that's for all this disclaimer is. Um, I have a roadmap for you. Um, so a foundation cornerstone, the strength of that cornerstone determines the overall integrity of the structure. So I want y'all as we're going through to think about your healthcare practice. Inpatient, outpatient, think of it as a building or a puzzle. What's the cornerstone that will ensure the strongest foundation to support a flexible infrastructure that leads to long-term sustainability? How do we ensure that the foundation of the business has the strength and flexibility needed to maneuver the fluidity of the current healthcare landscape? We're going to look at all that today. Um, and actually, we're going to look at it today and in the two sessions that are to come. Um, I want to start by saying a special thanks to our longtime partner at NOSOR, um, National Rural Health Resource Center, um, for providing the opportunity for me to be with y'all today. We value our partnership with them and hope that if y'all haven't had an opportunity to work closely with them or, or you haven't had an opportunity um, for very long, that you'll take advantage of this opportunity and really lean in um, to what they can do. They are just outstanding folks and really know their stuff. Um, so, a little about you, I've seen a little bit, um, some folks from state offices, hey y'all, nice to see you, um, and just, if you will, just go ahead and keep dropping that in the chat box so um, we can know kind of who's here and what your role is and how you fit in. This is a little bit about me, but the most important thing to know about me is I'm a fur mama um, to Ryder, who is uh, the front little puppy there. Uh, he's a five and a half year old um, rescue, and then Buster, who's an 11 year old pug. Um, the other important thing to know about me is I'm not clinical. So sometimes my um, examples are not physiologically possible, so just go with it. We like to have a little fun. 
And as Angie alluded to, I'm with the National Organization of State Offices of Rural Health. We are the member organization of the 50 state offices across the country, and um, we provide capacity building and support to state offices and their stakeholders, and we work with our partners, um, which is basically how we got here. And there are several slides here that talk about NOSOR and all the great things we do, and the link to the website is there. We have lots of free tools that if you're interested, don't hesitate to go check it out. Um, talking about state offices, if you've never worked with your state office of rural health, um, they basically have three functions. Information dissemination, getting the word out to you. Um, kind of rural health coordination and technical assistance. Um, the way I think about it is state offices are your one-stop shop for everything rural health. So don't hesitate to reach out to them. If you don't know your state office, um, you can go to NoSource website that the link was earlier on a couple slides earlier. And we have a listing by state and it gives you contact names, a little bit about the office, um, position, so no matter what you're looking for, you can find the information. And the role of state offices is really important in rural health across the country. State offices are natural and neutral conveners and really the one-stop shop. You see these four things, um, source for data, leveraging resources, and connecting state and national partners. That is really um, somebody that you need to know um, in order to be successful. The important thing to know is that NOSOR, the state offices, all of our partners across the country, and y'all, the folks that are providing services, we're all working towards the same goal. Despite our rural communities generally having older, sicker, and poorer populations, we're all dedicated every day to making our rural communities more well. One thing I will point out to you, the power of rural movement created, uh, was created to spotlight or focus on the positive, unique characteristics of rural and specifically rural health. If you don't already celebrate National Rural Health Day, the third November of every year, the third Thursday in November of every year, this is a great year to start. November 18th, if you go to thepowerofrural.org, you'll learn all about the power of rural, how to submit about community stars, which are the rock stars of rural health across the country. We celebrate them. We recognize them. We, we um, shout them out during National Rural Health Day month, basically. Um, but on the day, make sure you have a party because it's really a day to celebrate. And the power of rural is basically four tenets. Collaborate, educate, communicate, and innovate. And when you think of rural, when I think of rural, these four words definitely come to mind. And we're going to use these four words kind of as we go along. You'll hear me kind of throw them in every now and again. So just remember, the power of rural is all about collaboration, education, communication, and innovation. That's how we get to the next level and how we take the next step on our journey to value. So just a question to ponder, kind of as we go along. It's rhetorical, so you don't have to answer. But how might the focus on these four concepts, educate, communicate, collaborate, and innovate, how might they impact operational efficiency for our business? And in doing that, how does operational efficiency, how is it fueled to provide forward momentum on this journey to value? So just be thinking about that kind of as we go along. So here's our question of the day. This is where we're going to start. Why? Why do you do what you do in the way you do it. Feel free to drop thoughts in the chat. I would love to read them. Why do you do what you do in the way that you do it? And you can apply it to whatever your role is in your business, in your organization. If you're CEO or you're the front desk person collecting 
um, co-payments and scheduling appointments, or you're a lab tech, or you're a nurse, or you're a provider, you can apply this question to your world. Simon Sinek, you might know him. He is a leadership skills development guru guy. He's a YouTube, TED Talk author. Um, he talks about getting to the why of your business. That's how you make impact, being able to convey that why. Why is important it to understand why an organization does what it does in the way that it does it. Um, this little YouTube video is about three minutes long. It's actually a snippet from a, a longer talk that Simon Sinek does, and it's about the golden circle and why. Um, if you've not seen it, I would strongly encourage you to take three minutes and watch it, and then you might decide you want to go watch the whole TED Talk. Um, it's pretty awesome. Um, but talking about the why is a great lead-in to value. What's the big deal? So kind of stop the story for a minute. You're like, okay, she went from why to medical necessity. What is that about? Well, medical necessity is the why, right, for clinical services. It's the why you do what you do. Every service has a purpose or you don't do it. Why are we performing the service that we're perform performing on that particular patient at that particular time? Is it medically necessary? Is there another option? Or is it just the right thing to do for the patient? Does that really justify medical necessity? The answer is no. Just because it's the right thing to do may not necessarily mean it's medically necessary. Remember, the reason we're chasing high quality and high value is to help our patients and communities to be more well. That's our why, right? For all intents and purposes, that's our why, why we do what we do. So now I want to get back to that building analogy that I was using, or puzzles. I like both. Um, so what are components? They're a part, a building block, a puzzle piece. Put the components together to make the whole. So that's really how we're going to think about what makes up the different parts of value and how do they come together to form a perfect picture and really tell the story of the services that we provide in the most accurate, complete, and um, and I'm going to use the word engaging way in order to ensure that we are um, ensuring that our reimbursement is maximized in an appropriate way to help us be sustainable and be viable for years to come. But remember that the why we do what we do is the driving force behind how the pieces fit together. So we're gonna to talk about value-based healthcare. I know you're excited, right? I'm excited. So we're gonna talk about some characteristics and definitions, and then we're gonna kinda of lean in a little more. Um, it's interesting to me that there are lots of different definitions for value-based care, right? But so there are several ways to define it, but it all started with the Institute of Medicine STEEP. So I like to, to call this STEEP because when we, in a minute, we're going to talk about it a little more, but it is kind of steep. Um, then on to the triple A, so we had STEEP and then on to the triple A, which is better patient outcomes, better patient satisfaction, and lower cost. Right, right people, right place, right cost, right? Now we're on to the quadruple aim, which is the triple aim plus healthcare professional and or provider well-being. Okay, so now let's talk about steep for a second. So you see the, 
the way we get to seat. So it's safe, not harming the patient, which is always a good start, right? Timely, reducing wait times, sometimes delays that can cause harm or impact, have a neg negative impact on outcomes. Effective, making sure services are based on scientific knowledge. So that comes back to medical decision making and judgment, right? So making sure that you're not underusing or misusing services and procedures. Is it efficient, avoiding waste, including waste of equipment, supplies, ideas, energy, and I would dare to add staff time, right? That's a valuable resource, so we don't want to forget that either. Um, is it equitable? Providing care doesn't vary in quality because of who the person is or characteristics that they have. Is it patient-centered? We work in rural health, so I'm going to just tell you right now, my belief is, and I believe this to the core of my being, that all the care we provide is patient-centric. Um, it's just what rural does. We take care of our own. So that's deep for you, right? Um, it was, I, I did take a liberty here and reorder these because it didn't match the acronym. So I will just tell you. Um, so this framework that was put forth by the Institute of Medicine, the six aims for the healthcare system. So it wouldn't matter if you were inpatient or outpatient or wherever you're doing services, that these would apply. So here's no source definition. I tend to be, I'm a very linear person. So I tend to um, want to get there on a straight line. So our definition is a little more straightforward. So when we talk about value and moving towards value, what are we really talking about? What do we need to make sure we're keeping in mind, especially if we're just starting down the road from volume to value and developing processes and procedures? So let's look at this very simple kind of straightforward definition. So um, value-based care refers to the departure from a system in which providers are paid for the number of healthcare service, services provided, that's the volume, to a focus on an approach designed around, around patients for improved health, which means better outcomes, quality delivery of care, and at lower cost. So it's patient-centric for improved health or better outcomes, quality delivery of care, and lower cost of care. So we're really focusing on some behind-the-scenes items too, right? Payment incentives that reward value rather than volume. If you're part of um, an ACO or an MCO, um, you might already be tracking certain metrics that if you reach certain benchmarks, you get some kind of payment incentive or bonus. Models of care that you're coordinating and integrating clinical services with a focus on prevention and wellness. Because remember, really, value, when you talk about value, we're getting away from treating symptoms and being reactive and trying to be proactive, right? We're trying to help communities and patients be more well. And the way we do that is to help them early on, earlier on, before there are, and I'm using air quotes here, really bad symptoms. And then, of course, information sharing. But A, for transparency on cost and quality care. And B, to help with better decision making or allowing decision making by providers, but and consumers, patients, and patient families. 
So it's not just about, oh, we're just going to stop paying you for doing 279213s or 27,000, depending on how big you are, 99213s. We really want you to start thinking about the patient as a person and ensuring that we're doing everything we can to help them become more well instead of just treating symptoms. So what's the big deal? Why do we care? Are value and quality the same things? Why do we want to move to value-based service delivery anyway? Especially since if you're a CMS certified rural health clinic, you get paid under an all-inclusive rate. Why do you care? Remember, what is the why we do what we do? The why is the story of value, and at the root of value is medical necessity, right? Because medical necessity is why we do what we do. What services are we providing? It's the culmination of the determination of intensity of services, complexity of the issues that the patient is is suffering at the moment. It's the complexity of the decision making that the provider has to take into account. It is the story, right? It, it's the, the crux of the story. The answers to these, to determine medical necessity, you have to answer these five questions. What service is needed? Why are we performing it? How will we perform it? Who's going to do it? And where is the service performed? The answers to these questions not only establish medical necessity, but also demonstrate intensity and complexity. Understanding that medical necessity is the underlying why we do what we do, and we're trying to demonstrate value. So let's take a walk down memory lane where all this started and where we're trying to go. Medical decision making is key to ensuring appropriate care and, by the way, appropriate billing and reimbursement, but we'll get to that. So in our value definition, we're focusing around patients for improved health, quality delivery care, and lower cost. How do medical necessity and value connect? Well, if the service isn't medically justified, there is no value. The goal is to help our patients stay and become more well, not just treating the disease after it presents, trying to move toward better wellness overall trying to move toward better wellness overall. Hmm, how do we do that? This slide is probably gonna be burned into your memory after the three uh, sessions that we spend together. Documentation is the cornerstone of the business. Why do I say that? I am so glad you asked because if it's not documented, it didn't happen, and therefore can't be coded, can't be billed, and it won't be reimbursed if it's not billed, right? So understanding that documentation is the story of the why we did what we did. It determines the complexity. It determines and demonstrates the intensity. So therefore, it explains the value of the services that we provide, right? So if you have solid documentation, and some of you might have put your hand to your forehead and just kind of shook your head, because I guarantee especially our office manager folks or our coder folks. Now, sometimes providers struggle with documentation. Documentation is not something that's generally taught in medical school, unfortunately. 
when I worked for North Carolina, I was very fortunate. I got to work with the folks um, through AHEC Area Health Education Center out in the western part of the state. Um, they had a rural residency track. And the, the medical director of the rural residency track happened to be the medical director of a rural health clinic that I worked with. And he asked if I would do some documentation and coding work with some of the residents. Um, that was some of the most rewarding work I've ever done because those, those guys and girls um, just really were hungry for information and understanding and you know that was kind of back in the day now I'm aging myself when EHRs were really just coming along and um, kind of figuring out how all that was going to work and how important documentation is and was um, so just understanding if you don't remember anything else I say today please remember documentation is the cornerstone of the business so now I want to switch gears for just a second I want to talk about measuring. How do you measure value in a healthcare system? Really? How do you, what is that about? Well, never fear. We have an equation. Um, those of you that have been around for a little while, um, especially the centers for innovation that have kind of popped up around, you know, um, they like to come up with, with handy dandy quick ways to determine if you're doing what you need to do. So the healthcare value equation provides a way to understand how well an organization is performing really in the vision of STEEP and the framework of the triple aim. So it hasn't really caught up to the quadruple aim yet, but it will. Um, it's defined as quality of care made up of outcomes, safety, and service. So outcomes plus patient experience, basically, divided by the total cost of patient care over time. So if you were to do this equation today, it would be a snippet, right? A snapshot today. But if you, once a month, twice a month, whatever, over time, really start, start leaning in, you'll have some trend information that can really help you start to pinpoint where you might have some challenges within the business. And then it's a matter of, since you've identified where some of the challenges are, starting to focus in. And at the end of the day, value is not when I'm thinking. Value is not stagnant, right? You always want to continue to increase the value or the perceived value of what you're doing. You want to increase that return on investment. You want to ensure that your patients have better outcomes and that your um, patient satisfaction is great and that you're provider and staff satisfaction is great. So you never really get to the, oh, yay, we have value, we're done kind of thing. Just like quality, right? And quality, when you say the word quality, unless you have specific benchmarks you're looking at for very specific topics or services, the word quality can be subjective because quality to me in North Carolina might be different than quality to somebody else in, I don't know, Hawaii. So figuring out where you are and where you're trying to get and just taking the next step. We're all about building forward momentum on this journey to value because it's going to be uh, what that, that saying it's a marathon, not a sprint, that is the journey to value and high quality. But the healthcare value equation is one of those things that you can start looking at at periods of time, 
whether it's every other week or once a week or once a month or once a quarter, and be able to see trends over time. The other interesting fact about value is, I just alluded to it, it's variable, right? The U.S. health system produces some of the best outcomes in the world, but also some of the worst as measured by mortality amenable to healthcare. For example, the top five U.S. states would consistently rank near the top of developed countries, whereas the bottom five would trail all others, if that makes sense. So the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, Quality, AHRQ, if you don't know these guys, I would strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you um, to check them out. They have tons of information on their website. Um, they have a little bit of something for everybody, really. This link will actually take you to comparison of 50 states in the District of Columbia across all healthcare quality measures that are tracked. It's very interesting, um, a little, depending on what state you're from, um, some states do really, really well and some states don't. But as we know, the quality of healthcare varies widely depending on where you are across the country. So the, these are state snapshots and it's an interactive tool and it uses more than 250 statistical measures to offer state-by-state -state summaries of healthcare quality. So you can check out your state and, um, oops, sorry, um, check out your state and see where you rank and see where some of the challenges are that, are your, that your state has and see if they are applicable or are, are they the same for in your business, if that makes sense. So now I'm going to get back to my favorite topic, how documentation is the cornerstone of the business. Um, I'll apologize now if I get a little preachy, but this is really important. It's really important to understand, and I hope I can articulate why this is so important and the direct line, the solid line between clinical documentation and reimbursement. Again, you will see this slide several times. Documentation is the cornerstone of the business. Everything that happens in the business is built on that cornerstone. So if it's not strong, the building is not really strong, right? Or if you don't get the, the important part of the puzzle put together, the most important part of the puzzle put together, then it's hard to do the rest of the puzzle and, and make all the pieces fit. So just remember that if it's not documented, it didn't happen and therefore can't be coded or billed for reimbursement. That is a mantra that is said over and over by coders and billers um, a lot. But also like dominoes. So not only is it's important that things are documented, but they need to be documented as accurately and completely and as in the most descriptive way as they possibly can to tell the story of the services that are provided. Because it's really like dominoes. Incomplete documentation leads to incomplete coding. For those of you that aren't coders, if it's not documented, you're not allowed to code it. And if it's not coded, you bill or so, if it's not coded, then you can't bill it. And if you can't bill it, that means you're not going to receive reimbursement. So there is your solid line between documentation and reimbursement. Huh. So... I don't know if you guys know this, so I think it's important to understand a little bit. I'm going to run through this pretty quickly, and if you have questions, don't hesitate to either drop them in the chat or 
um, you can sit, you're welcome to send me an email or we can work out how we get together. But basically, documentation has components that have to be addressed in order to be considered, and I'm using air quotes, complete. There are seven components in the CPT and CMS's documentation guidelines for evaluation and management services. I'm only talking about evaluation and management at the moment, which are basically general office visits, like a 99213 for an established patient, um, because there are some weeds that start coming up when you start talking about other service bank code, code families. Um, so I don't want to muddy the waters any more than I have to. Um, so these are the seven components. The first three are known as the key components, history, physical exam, and medical decision making. The history, remember, is made up of, that one component is made up of the chief complaint, the review systems, the history of present illness, and past family and social history. So you have several components that make up that one component. Then you have the physical exam, which of course is a physical exam. It's the provider basically putting hands on the person. And then comes in the hard part, medical decision making. That's where we determine complexity and intensity. That's where the medical decision making comes into play. That's really where the heart of the story lies. And then we use four, five, six, and seven until recently, um, kind of as the background or the context of the story. Um, remember, counseling and coordination of care have some time requirements with them. And now requirement number seven um, has some additional weight because of some changes in uh, component requirements that went into effect January 1. We're not planning to talk about that during this series. If you have questions about that, you can shoot me an email and I'm happy to send you some CMS guidance on it. Um, happy to do that for you. And if you have questions about documentation components, it's really important for you to understand why documentation is so important and be able to articulate that and convey it to your providers. Your providers want to be good at what they do. They didn't go into medicine um, to have to document all the time, but there's a way for them to understand how to meet the requirements and meet the components in a way that really does tell the story and really ensures completeness and accuracy and really demonstrates that um, complexity and intensity of medical decision making and the necessity of providing whatever services were provided. So again, I hope I'm convincing you that documentation is the cornerstone of the business. Because if it is, when we talk about the foundation and infrastructure, we need a strong foundation and a flexible infrastructure. How are we going to do that? Well, you got to have that strong cornerstone to begin with. And when you're looking at it from an operational perspective and you're looking at all the different components, how do you put them together to really um, make the whole fit together the way it should? Um, the individual pieces fit together to tell the entire story. All the, all the individual components or parts are important and they all have a place. So, the strong foundation obviously starts with the question of the day. Why? Why do we do what we do in the way we do it? If the foundation is built on the why, which remember, documentation tells the story of the why, right? You see the connection there? Understanding that that's how our business is built is the first step on the road to value. If you can grasp and get your head around that the documentation, which is the cornerstone of the business, tells the story of your why in that particular visit, building the rest of the business on that cornerstone will give you that strong foundation. 
And from there, you really have to have that accurate documentation. And, and what's a way to do that? Clinical documentation improvement. If you don't have a CDI plan or you don't have a program in place, you know, there are um, vendors that sell CDI programs. And there are vendors that um, every you can find for purchase everything from templates to do chart reviews to um, software that you can plug in um, production by CPT and come up with what your documentation should look like. There are all kinds of options um, for CDI programs. So finding the right CDI program for you and your providers um, might take a minute simply because there are so many options. But I will guarantee you over time, <coughs> excuse me, it will um, benefit you, your provider, your patients, and your overall organization. Um, it will serve you well. Um, understanding the importance of clinical documentation and really being able to um, call it out from the C-suite level all the way through the organization. It's important that folks understand that that's really the foundation of the business and how you go about um, defining and demonstrating your value and the services that you provide. So what is operational efficiency and why do we care? Um, the operational efficiency is a manufacturing term, as you might know, um, but basically it's production of a high quality service, we're a service, not a product, while reducing waste overall, in time, effort, and materials as much as possible. And effort includes staff time, right? If we were to workflow your business, how much wasted staff time might we find? Maybe that's low hanging fruit. Take a look at some processes. See if there are ways to make them more efficient. So, the cool thing about operational efficiency is you can actually come up with a number, right? So to calculate it, it's your total operating expenses divided by total, total revenue. Why does that matter? What does that even mean? Anything? Does that mean anything to you? That's your sweet spot for long-term sustainability. If you can put that number and explain how you got, how you arrived at that number, and again, watch it over time. Have this be something that you're tracking. Does that, is operational efficiency a component of value? Sure it is. Anytime you're improving efficiency, that's another step towards value. And that leads us into this more flexible infrastructure. And I don't mean there are no curbs, don't get me wrong. Just some wiggle room when you need it. The entire organization can pivot relatively quickly. So think about where you were a year ago. Maybe even like February, mid-March last year. Did you have to pivot did your business have to pivot the way you provide services? Did it pivot? How quickly were you able to do that? How quickly were you able to uptake the changes in telemedicine? That might be a really good one to look at. Check your production by CPT code. Compare over time. Has that service consistently increased in utilization? What do you need to be to have a flexible infrastructure? Number one, trust. Without fail, trust. Does that mean you're not afraid? Not at all. Does it mean you're not going to mess up? Not at all. Actually, what trust does mean, and I'm going to tie emotional intelligence there too, what those two give you is an environment where people aren't afraid to try things. They're not afraid to make suggestions. 
if you as an office manager can trust your front desk person to schedule appropriately or to to try open scheduling or they have some kind of suggestion to change your scheduling the environment will a the team will become more cohesive it just will over time and you'll find that more folks are willing to really be part of the team, really lean in, really put themselves out there. And that's when you see in real innovation happen in a safe environment. And I don't mean to use that term in a cheesy kind of way, um, but the flip side is that's really what we're going for, right? Having a clear, concise vision that everybody on the team understands and can articulate. Understanding that leaders eat last. What does that mean? That's another Simon Sinek thing. What does that mean? True leaders are not afraid to serve. I'm gonna leave that right there. Try, try again. If, if there's mistakes, if there are obstacles, if there are challenges, just keep at it, keep at it. I think I can, I think I can. Having that positive can do, keep everybody moving forward, even in the face of obstacles, even in the face of a pandemic. Having that ability and the trust amongst the people in your practice, in your hospital, in your department, will keep that forward momentum that you need stay on the road to value. And again, clinical documentation in an RHC, let's talk specifically about a rural health clinic. You might say documentation doesn't matter. We have an all-inclusive rate. Who cares? That's not quite true, friends. So when you think about it, back in 2016, rural health clinics had to start reporting CPT, uh, all CP, all hit picks codes, CPT, hit picks, and ICD-10 codes. Yes, they do roll up into a uh, revenue code for the most part. However, those CPT codes are tracked. Those ICD-10 codes are tracked. So. At some point, if you've not already experienced it, you will experience it because that's just how the healthcare environment works. At some point, the MAC will ask you for a document review and they will check your coding and documentation. So understanding that even in an RHC, just because you have an all-inclusive rate does not make you exempt from ensuring that your clinical documentation tells the story that it needs to tell. And you have to remember that Medicare and Medicaid are not your only payers. You might have Blue Cross, you might have TRICARE, you might have United, you might have Aetna. Somebody at some point is going to ask to see documentation. And let's ensure that our providers are set up to be successful. And the way they're set up to be successful is helping them understand how to document as completely and accurately telling that story of the services that are provided, it demonstrating the medical necessity and the medical decision making that were needed for that particular visit. Clinical documentation is important to the business no matter what the provider type. So as I start drawing to a close, and I have about five minutes, how do you tell your story? You use reports? your data, right, to tell the story of services provided. That's what your practice management side of your electronic health record is, right? The way you get to maximize reimbursement is telling the complete story of the services provided and the intensity and complexity of those services. Every service has a purpose or you don't do it. Making sure that you can demonstrate that medical necessity and that you are clearly, clearly Identifying the why, how, and what of the service, that's the connection to value. Making sure that we can recon reconcile 
how the determination of operation efficiency, that quantitative component, to the transition to value or qualitative, how do we do that? And how can we use these determinations to frame up this transition to value-based care? Operational efficiencies are the way to tell that part of the story. Hopefully, I've convinced you that documentation is the cornerstone of the business. Without strong documentation, the coding and billing and therefore reimbursement aren't maximized. The documentation also helps tell the story of value, the impact of the service delivery has on the patient, the why we do what we do in the way that we do it. The documentation tells the story of your business. Making sure that our operational perspective, these pieces that need to fit together are in the correct order. Just want to revisit the definition as we really start to wrap up. We're really talking about the getting away from a volume-based healthcare system, meaning it's just about the numbers. How many 99213s did you do? And a focus on a patient-centric, high quality outcomes, quality delivery of care, and lower cost of care. That's what we're going for. We're looking at those payment incentives. We're looking at the models of care. We're thinking about information sharing and how we go about doing that in a way that supports the documentation, that helps us tell the story, right? At the end of the day, it takes every member of a practice or hospital or whatever setting you find yourself to be successful. This is the new era of healthcare. There is no us and them. They, those days are over. Um, somebody once said it takes a village to be successful, or in this case, it takes village people. Ha <laughs> ha. So seriously, everybody has a role in the success or non-success of a service line or practice. The time to prepare for the transition to value is now. And this, you participating in this project, may be your first step in that direction. But remember that the reason we're chasing high quality and high value is to help our patients and communities, these are our neighbors, to be more well. That's the why we do what we do in the way that we do it. I only have one minute left, but I would like you to think and maybe drop in the chat, what's one takeaway from today's session? What's one little nugget that you can apply immediately or at least start exploring? Did you find value in anything you heard today? If so, I would love to hear what it is. Did you hear one thing that you might be able to implement to increase revenue or begin consideration of billing for different services or uh, a CDI plan or just taking that first step on the road to value? So final thoughts, continue learning with us. This is a three session education series. Tap into your state office of rural health, answer this polling question that just popped up. That would be great. Remember your state office is a one-stop shop to rural health expertise. I appreciate y'all being here. I have lots of um, resources in the back for you of the slides. Hope you'll look through those ongoing assistance. Your State Office of Rural Health and the RHPTP folks are always available for consultation. We're here to provide any kind of help that we can. But the important thing to remember is you're not alone. There are lots of folks trying to provide these and other important services to their patients all across the country. Help us help you. And in turn, you might pave the way to move the power of rural forward and help your rural community become more well.
I want to take a moment to thank Kiana and Angie and the RHPTP team at the National Rural Health Resource Center for the opportunity to spend some time with y'all. I hope you found some value in our time together today, and I look forward to seeing you at our next <coughs> session in a couple of weeks. Thanks so much, y'all. Angie? Thank you so much, Tammy. Um, that was such an insightful presentation, and I know that we're all really looking forward to even more now the next webinars in the series. Those are gonna be services that jumpstart and assist in the transition to uh, from volume to value. And then the third and final uh, webinar in the series is first steps and next steps in the transition to uh, volume and value. Um, before signing off, um, I appreciate you participating in the, these last two final polls. Just a reminder that the recording for today's webinar and the slides will be available on our health webinar playback page within five business days. I have put that link into the chat box as well. Um, also a link uh, or in our email address, you can reach out to the RIPS uh, TA staff at any time for, for questions. Um, we also ask that you complete the short online assessment for this webinar. I've placed that link in the chat box as well. Uh, if you are looking to receive an ACHA credit for ACHE credit for today's webinar, uh, you will need to uh, complete that assessment. So that link is also in the chat box. So as always, we encourage you to reach out to us with any questions. Thank you everyone again for your participation today. And thank you so much, Tammy, for lending your, your time and expertise to us today. And uh, we look forward to the last two webinars in this series. Thanks so much, everyone, awesome. again. Pardon me? I said my pleasure. Sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.